Good evening and welcome to the Gospel Centered Bible Study for Flat Earth Friends. Um, and this is this week we're going to be discussing Matthew chapter 2. And last week we didn't do this, and this week I think I'm going to do it this way. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually start with a prayer because I think that um, you know I, we need to. There's a prayer to the Holy Spirit that we, I usually say before reading scripture. And uh, I think it would be a good idea to do this. Um, you know, I, we, and so anyway, um, if you're in the YouTube broadcast, uh, you can click on the lower left-hand corner to go to the Hangout page if you want to get into the Q&A Q session. And uh, once you get there, you'll see a little nine square icon in the upper right hand corner you click on that and it will enable the q and a uh window for you anyway so i'd like to say this prayer that uh, we say before scripts studying scripture because a prayer to the holy ghost which you know we're supposed to study scripture with the aid of the holy ghost so anyway and i'm going to warn you um i do make the sign of the cross because i am a catholic and so don't get upset by it. Um, I have a friend who is from Czech Republic, and she was there under the battle days of the Soviet Union. And they would actually throw people in jail for making the sign of the cross. Uh, but people would do it anyway because they weren't ashamed of their faith. So, And I'm not ashamed of my faith either. So I will begin with the sign of the cross as we always do prayers. Catholics do that way. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, come Holy Ghost, and fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fires of thy divine love. Lord, send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost didst instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant by that same spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So anyway, uh, to begin, like I said, if you want to get on the Q&A, uh, there's a click on the link in the lower left-hand corner on the YouTube page, and it will bring you to the Hangout page. And then uh, click on the upper right-hand corner. There's a nine-square icon. Click on that, and it will enable the... Um, the hangout um, Q and A window. So, anyway, I wanted to begin <clears throat> by reading a scripture because this is really key to the Gospel of Matthew, and it's um, it's First uh, John chapter four. Uh, verses 1 through 3, I think. It's, you know, I, I never read just one verse. So. Anyway, and I'm reading from the King James uh, 1611 version. Okay. Uh, these pages are really thin. Here we go. First John chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now it is already in the world. So <clears throat> basically, what that's saying, and this is something I think that is very true about our understanding of 
of Christianity is that every false doctrine can be reduced down to either an attack on the divinity of Christ or an attack on the humanity of Christ. And so that's why they say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. In other words, he is not only true God, but he is also true man. So both of those together, neither reducing the other, whole and entire in one person. So it, and it, that's kind of a mystery, but generally any false doctrine can be boiled down to either an attack on Jesus Christ as God or Jesus Christ as man. So anyway, I, I bring that up because this week we're going to be talking about Matthew chapter 2, which is the birth of Jesus. And I have noticed in the past couple of months that there have been some very serious attacks on Christmas. And I know a lot of people think Christmas is this falls pagan worship thing, but you know, it doesn't, you know, because they say it was centered around the date of some god, whatever. And the thing is not when we celebrate Christmas. The point is that we do celebrate the birth of Christ because that is, we acknowledge that he is true, truly man, truly human. So, uh, and, and in fact, there's a, I'm going to put a link in, I just thought of this, I'm going to put a link in the, in the recording afterwards. There's a, a Lutheran pastor. He's really funny. Uh, he's, his, he's, he has this, um, website called Lutheran satire and he, he, uh, teaches the faith by making fun of stuff. So anyway, but he has a, 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 a YouTube video called Horace ruins Christmas. And it kind of goes through in actually a funny way about some of the misconceptions about Christmas being a pagan holiday. And, you know, I know some people don't like it, but the thing is, is the, there are a lot of Christians who celebrate Christi Christmas, and I don't, I don't think there's nothing wrong. It's not just Catholics, it's Lutherans, it's Methodists, it's Episcopalians, Anglicans, the entire Eastern Orthodox churches, the Coptics. I mean, we're talking a lot of, lot of people who profess to be Christians who celebrate Christmas, not because they're looking at any pagan God, but they are looking at Christ born into the world as true man. So God with us, Emmanuel. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll put that link in there later. And that way, if you um, want to look at that, and I think you'll get a laugh out of it. It's pretty funny. <clears throat> Excuse me. You got a touch of that cold like Patricia Steer had. Um, anyway, like you say, we're bring, beginning with the Gospel of Matthew. So in chapter two, we're talking about the birth of Christ. <clears throat> and in chapter two, um, let's see. The problem is I don't do this online, and so I have to look at my notes, my hand notes in my hand book, and it's like all very low tech, but I think it's, you know, I, I think we shouldn't get in too much of a habit of, like, just doing everything online. It's nice to, to have a Bible in your hand and feel it and, and really, you know, look through it. Okay, so anyway. So. Okay, so... Now this, we're talking about the birth of Christ. Oh, we're up to four viewers. If anybody wants to get in on the Q&A, uh, click the link in the lower left-hand corner of the YouTube page, and then it'll bring you to the Hangout page, and then you can click on the nine squares icons in the upper right 
corner of the Hangout page, and they'll, it'll open the question and answer table. So, anyway, so we begin <clears throat> in chap chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, this isn't like biblical, but by tradition, their names and the, the country of origin of the, the three kings, there are probably more than three, but there were three that were identified very early on in the church. And uh, this is was recognized by the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholics and, and the Coptics who were around there at the time. I mean, those people have been in the Middle East since, since the days of Christ. So they're pretty accurate. But anyway, there are the three kings that are, and some of you may know this, but some of you may not. There were three kings that were identified. The first was Belshazzar, who was from Persia, and Gaspar, who was from Arabia. And Belshazzar brought the frankincense, according to tradition. And Gaspar was from Arabia, and he brought the gold. And uh, Melchior, who was the youngest of the three kings, was from Egypt, and he brought the myrrh. So does the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So just a little side note there. I um, hope I'm not stepping too far outside the Bible, too. But those were three that were known by tradition and, and the countries that they came from. So, and like I say, they were astronomers or astrologers, they would have called them back then. And they see a star in the east, or a new star in the heaven, they think a new king is born. So anyway, back to the reading here. Okay. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now, there's a little bit more to it. And this was out of Micah. So if we go back to it's a Micah chapter, I think it's, let's see. Oh, no way. That's... um. Let's see, check my notes here. Yeah, Micah 5 2. So, anyway, um, there was another note here. I was just going to check it. Uh, okay, sorry. This is what happens when you do things by paper. Okay, Mick, Micah, Jonah, darn it, I don't have the prophets in order, oh no, it's Malachi, sorry. I invited some people to be guests and they didn't show up, I was hoping somebody would help me to read all this. So if you just joined and you want to uh, get to the question and answers, you can click on the link in the lower left right hand or the lower left hand corner. You click on the link in the YouTube page in the lower left hand corner, and then it brings you to the Hangout page. And then you can click on the nine square button in the upper right hand corner, and it will bring you to the uh, question. It'll open the question and answers. Because I don't think there's any chat box open in, let me see. No, it didn't open the chat box. <laughs> it's disabled. I can never figure out how to do it. So, so if you want to have, if you want to talk, you need to click on the lower right hand corner. And then when you get to the hangout page, go to the upper left hand corner of the nine square box and it will open the question and answers. 
Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Sorry guys, I'm just having trouble figuring out. Okay. I'm not as used to using the sixteen eleven version. But, okay, here we go, Micah. So, we're reading from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Yeah. Hear ye, O mountains. No, that's the wrong one, sorry. But, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, ye shall... Oh, Teresa, did you want to join the hangout? I don't. Uh, is it, it? I should. If you should have got a link, if you want to join the hangout, so if you do, if you want to join as a guest, you should have gotten a link in the. Let's see. You're just gonna watch then. Okay. I saw a few people pop up there. Okay, so anyway, okay, back to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet shall out of, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So... And I've heard it also as from eternity to eternity. So it's like, in other words, his going forth is not like Jesus Christ didn't just start when he was born as a child in Bethlehem. He has always been there from the very beginning, and he will be there always until the very end because he exists outside of time. And that becomes important later on when we have to understand what happens after he ascends into heaven. It does not like he's gone, right? So, anyway. Anyway, back to, now that, as you can see, Matthew, they said it one way, but there, there's a little more expansion of the verse. So I always like to go back and, and read the verse in in the old test old testament as well again so that we get as we go through the gospel we also get all the things from the old testament that apply to it okay so anyway back to here okay we're in chapter seven of second chapter of matthew verse seven when herod then herod when he had privily called the wise men inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he hath found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Then when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And okay, that was the next one. 
Oh, by the way, I got my other book out that was on the other side of the room that has the extra notes in it. It's like this huge monster Bible. As well as my Greek, English, New Testament. And this thing is huge and has lots of notes in it. It's like monster Bible. <laughs> so if I need to check a reference, I can look in there. Anyway. And when they had heard the king, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till they came and stood over where the young child was. Now, another interesting thing about Bethlehem, it was the city of David. And the name, this is no, what I just thought of, the name Bethlehem means house of bread. So this becomes important later on when uh, further on in the Gospels, they're going to see this uh, uh, recurring theme of the bread and manna and, and all that sort of thing. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up, the, the house of bread. Okay. And okay, so we begin chapter 10, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come in unto the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And there's a great deal of symbolism in the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Because gold was presented to him as the king that he was a king. And so like the, 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 of the line of David, so he was Christ the king. And then frankincense, because he is, the, the frankincense was the incense of the high priest. So in that case, he's also the high priest. And myrrh, which was a, a herb for the dead, um, it was because he was also the sacrifice. So he is pre king, priest, and sacrifice. These three gifts indicate his his three roles of, of king, priest, and sacrifice. And then it says, And they be warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, and they departed out of into their own country another way. That was chapter tw or verse twelve. And when they had departed, the angel, again, the angel keeps appearing to people in dreams. <laughs> and when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Okay, and that is Hosea uh, chapter 11. That, that prophecy is from Hosea chapter 11. I need... Okay, I've got one person in the in the in the chat there on, in the question and answer. Jack Passmore, hello. <laughs> if anybody wants to join the Q and A, um, click on the lower right hand corner of of the page. There's a link, and click on that. And then once you get into chat, go to the upper left hand upper right hand corner, the lower left hand corner, click on the link, and then once you're in the hangout page, go in the upper left hand corner to the uh, nine square icon and it will open the question and answers. Okay, so where were they? Oh yes, Hosea 11.1. One. Hosea chapter 11, 
Okay, then, okay, so here Christ is prefiguring Israel itself, where it says here, when Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt, out of, and called my son out of Egypt. So that's the actual verse from uh, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And that is the prophecy that Jesus Christ fulfilled because the, the Holy Family had to flee into Egypt. Then, okay, so we begin again in verse 16 of chapter 2. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had in diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, in Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted, because they are not. <clears throat> and then if we go to that actual prophecy in Jeremiah 31.15, Jeremiah is long. <laughs> 21. Okay, this is how it reads in Jeremiah. Again, I always like to read them in the Old Testament because sometimes the wording is slightly different. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel, actually it's pronounced Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they, are, they were not. So it's a slightly different wording, but it's always good to go back and read it in the Old Testament as well. <coughs> Okay, as so we begin again in chapter 19, or verse 19 in chapter 2 of Matthew. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to, to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the long, young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. So they returned back to Israel. <clears throat> but when he had heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream. He turned aside into parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, I don't have a reference on that. I wish somebody would join my guest. I'm not as good in the Old Testament as I am in the New Testament. So, now, Nazarene, it's funny because Nazarene, the word Nazareth means um, branch. So, it's sort of like, you know, like a branch in a river. Well, but it's, it's, it's a name that means branch, Netzer. It means comes from the word Netzer, which means branch. I knew I had some notes on this, and it's in Isaiah 11.1. 1. I always have to go back and forth because I don't have my notes in this book. It's too nice to be marking up. I, I, eventually, I'm going to probably have to break down and start marking up this book, too. Or this Bible, I always, I always don't like to mess up some. <laughs> you should see my old one. It's 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 like falling apart. Let's, let's see. Okay, Isaiah eleven one. So if we go back to Isaiah eleven verse chapter eleven verse one. Oh, by the way, if anybody doesn't have their Bible, they can actually click on one of those links below the YouTube uh, page and. There's like online Bibles. I put 
the ones I could think of there. Okay. Ten. Eleven. One. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. So this is what they're saying, because if you remember, they're speaking in either Aramaic and Hebrew. So the word branch, Nazareth, means branch. So that's why it doesn't seem that odd that this prophecy would apply, because it says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its his roots. So if we put the other word in there, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a netzer shall grow out of his roots. So that's why they call him a Nazarene, because he's that branch that Isaiah is referring to. It doesn't, obviously, in English, it comes out different, but it's that's what they mean for a branch or Nazarene. I hope everybody follows that. I, I don't know because nobody's coming in the Q and A area. <laughs> you guys are all staying on YouTube. <laughs> Just click on this link over here, right in there. Right in there, click that link. Okay, so we got all the way through chapter two, not too, too difficult, but again, all of this in Matthew is underscoring the humanity of Christ. He talks about his birth. He talks about his genealogy. He's saying this is a true man. It's not like he just appeared to be man. He was really born. So, Okay, chapter 3. We get to John the Baptist. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Jude Judea saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this, I think, is really interesting in where he's talking about repent ye. Now, uh, if we go back to, let's see, I think it's, I want to say Genesis 5. Okay, see, the problem is some things get lost in the English. Let's see, chapter two. Mm -hmm. ah, these pages stick together. Something awful. Three. Four. Okay, yeah, this is. Okay, this is during the days of Noah. Everybody's being really bad, and God is pretty fed up with all of them, right? So, um, anyway, and God saw, this is uh, Ezekiel, or Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So here's the thing. Is, is God repenting? I don't think so. <laughs> so anyway, so if we look at this in, in Matthew, if we go to the uh, Greek for that... I think I have a note in there. No, I don't have a note in there. Matthew chapter 3. I'm a little better prepared today. I have all the right books where I can grab them. Okay, so if we go to Matthew chapter... Oh, one page back. His interlinear Greek. Real hard to read. Can't find out where you're at. 
Okay, so this is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, where it says, In saying, do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if we look at that, the word in there is metanoiate. Now, metanoiate is not, when, when we look at, uh, and I don't have like it, I had a Septuagint. I, I want to get a Septuagint Old Testament because then you can compare the Greek word in the Old Testament to the Greek word in the New Testament. But it's a different word that they use in in uh, in Matthew or in Genesis chapter six verse six, where it says, "It repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart." Um, it I know in the Latin, it will say in there, it, the Lord, it has the word penitent, which just means you're sorry for something. You're sorry you made man because he's a big wreck. He's a mess. He's a, he's a train wreck, right? But in John the Baptist, in those days, cometh John the Baptist preaching. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, I'm having to jump around the Bible pretty fast here. So, okay. <laughs> I have two fisted Bibles here. Okay, so in, Je or in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, <clears throat> the word metanoite is not just being sorry for something. It's like, you're not only sorry for it, but you're turning your whole life around. You're going to really make up for all those bad things you did. It's not, it's like, it's like a different word. And in some it, Bibles, it will be rendered as do penance. You know, in other words, you're going to really, you know, really change. You know, you're not just sorry for what you did. You really are going to change. So it's an active verb. It, and so anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because people tend to look at repentance as like, you know, you're sorry. Why are you sorry? Because you did bad or because you got caught or, or what, you know? I mean, repent can have a lot of different meanings, you know? I mean, when you're a kid and you get caught, your parents can make you repent, you know? But it's not the same as actually being sorry and wanting to change your life and turn yourself around, turn back, right? So anyway, moving on. So, uh, see how are we doing for time? Oh, we can go all the way through chapter three too. <clears throat> okay, so we got through the first chapter two, verse three. We done verse verses one and two. Okay, so verse three says, "For this is he that is referring to John the Baptist that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying." The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And, uh, okay, this is in Isaiah 43. So I don't lose my place there. Okay. I think they actually... In the Bible, they they talk about this as a prophecy of John the Baptist. It's so clear in Isaiah that, let's see, 49. These are in Roman numerals, so it's really fun to read. Okay, here we go. Isaiah 43. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is a really interesting one because... This was one that was said to them as they were being led away into captivity in Babylon, which is very interesting. And it's it's uh, talking about, in even the Old Testament, if you have the King James, well, at least the 1611 version, it will point to this as a prophecy of John the Baptist and his preaching. So anyway, it starts at chapter 40, verses... Uh, well, it goes on for a while. Anyway, these are this is all about John the Baptist and the coming of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, beginning chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, 
that her iniquity is, is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord, Lord's hand double for all her sins. And again, this is pointing in the Old Testament to receive double for all your sins. It's like, that seems like amazing to the Old Testament Jew because it's always, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. So this is kind of prefiguring the idea of grace that is a greater portion of, of payment for those sins that would be enough to save your soul because all the blood of the sacrifice of the bulls and the lambs and the, and the goats was not enough to pay for man's sins. Only our Lord Jesus Christ could pay for those sins. And this is prefiguring that. So even though the key verse is further down, I, I wanted to read this whole thing because it's, it's very, very important. Chapter, okay, anyway, Isaiah, going on, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So this idea of prepare the way of the Lord, every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain, it's like everything will be made smooth and perfect. But the only thing that can do that is the shed blood of Christ. So, you know, we're talking again about grace. He's talking about this outflowing of grace. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Okay, and that ends at verse 5. So that's an expansion of that verse that was mentioned briefly in chapter 3. So, and we're doing pretty good. I want to keep these down to an hour. I don't want people having to... Okay. So then... and Okay, so we got through till we were on... Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. So we continue on Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. They went out to him, they went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions about the Jordan. And they were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, this baptism is not the same baptism that they have further on in the, in, the, in the Acts of the Apostles. The whole nature of baptism changes. There are a lot of... Oh, oh, Teresa, you, you asked a perfect question. <laughs> Thank you for showing up in Q&A. Uh, was John the baptized, the main baptizing person? Because I never heard of anyone else baptizing. Or is it because he baptized Jesus? Well, John was called the baptizer. Now, you have to understand that this baptism that he was um, performing was a, a kind of a baptism of repentance or penance. It's sort of like a symbolic washing away to wash clean, right? And so... Uh, <clears throat> You know, so he's, um, and I'm, I'm getting down to this part, so uh, later, but um, when Christ came to be baptized, it changed the whole nature of baptism at that point, because I, I heard it said that, that when Christ went down to the Jordan to be baptized, it was not that he needed to be made holy by the waters of baptism, but the, he would make the waters of baptism holy. So it's kind of like, because he didn't need to be cleansed of sins, he was pure and sinless. So he was, you know, and that's the way that was explained to me, that he didn't go down to the to be baptized, to be made holy by the waters, but to make the waters of baptism holy. It changed the nature of what baptism was. So anyway, uh, anyway, we'll get back to that. And 
and they were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But then, so, but he was called John the Baptist because he baptized Jesus. People were doing this ceremonial washing before, um, before the time of Jesus. It was a Jewish practice, and I, I know uh, I was hoping like. Mr. Thrive and Survivor, Rob Skiba, would be here so, because they're much better at the Old Testament stuff, and they would probably be able to explain it better than me. But um, anyway, so continuing on. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come unto his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? In other words, they were coming down to be baptized to make a show of their holiness you know like you know kind of like you know being sort of hypocritical about it like you know the out, inside they weren't really repentant they were just doing it to show to kind of go with the flow so so then he says so when he saw many of the pharisees and sadducees come to his baptism he said unto them "O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. And that means like worthy meat for repentance. Uh, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of the, all these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And okay, so anyway, and so he goes on. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. And this is prefiguring the, the loss of the Jewish people as the, chose, as the chosen people of Israel. It goes on further. Um, later on, it's also completely shown forth at the crucifixion where the veil of the temple is rent and the holy of holies is exposed and the spirit of god leads the temple so showing that the old covenant is done away and the new covenant the new testament is now active so this is prefiguring that where he says the axe is laid to the root of the tree all the way down to the beginning of israel And anything, and it, because it's bringing not forth good fruit, and it's hewn down and cast into the fire. Okay, as we continue now, Matthew chapter three, verse eleven. Indeed, I baptize with you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So this baptism will change after the new covenant is established at the at the crucifixion of christ and his resurrection so anyway so anyway let's go on further to okay so anyway we were at at baptize not where he will baptize you with holy ghost and with fire continuing on chapter 3 verse 12 whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So again, this actually kind of, uh, a lot of the harvest ish, um, later on when Christ is talking about the end of the world and kind of like this harvest theme where the wheat is gathered into the barns and the chaff and the weeds are burned. So anyway. Okay, so now we get to the, the key verse, chapter 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. Remember, they're cousins, so they know each other. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it be so for now, for thus becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered him. That means he permitted him. Uh, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now this is another 
key event here, besides being baptized and changing the nature of baptism to a true saving work, as opposed to, because I mean, even John the Baptist in, in verse 11 says, I'm just baptizing with water. It's going to change in the future. It's going to be something different, right? So, so anyway, but then we get to this is so full here in this 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 chapter because not only we're talking about the changing of baptism, but then at the end, Jesus, when he came out of the waters, the heavens were open and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descends on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven, the voice of, of God the Father, this is my behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So here <clears throat> again. A great support to the Holy Trinity, which I have always said is absolutely key to Christianity. Those that detract from the Holy Trinity, right? And remember, God is one God. You know, just like it says in the Old, the Old Testament, Shema Israel, El Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. You know, behold, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You know, that's, I mean, they say that every morning in, you know, in the Jewish prayers. So it's one God. So Jesus and the Father are one with the Holy Ghost. And there are other uh, prefigurings of the Trinity in the Old Testament, actually. In the case of the three angels that visit Abraham. Uh, who speak as one but three, but three but one. It goes back and forth, very, very interesting. So again, here we have this reference to the Trinity, the Father as the voice from heaven, the Holy Ghost, which is the, the form of the dove, and Jesus Christ, who is in the waters of baptism. So anyway, that gets to chapter, the end of chapter three. I don't know if we have time to continue on chapter four, but we can do that next week. And uh, we're finishing a little early. But anyway, anyway, I thank all the viewers that were out there. And hopefully um, people will see the recordings later on as well and be edified by them. And I'll paste that link about Christmas, you know, and kind of addressing the issue that some people see it as pagan but it really isn't and as i discussed earlier in the in the video i'll paste that link down there it's a pretty funny video uh, it's called horace ruins christmas so <laughs> anyway thank you all for for joining in and viewing and i will look forward to you next time when we will read matthew chapter four and maybe even five if we get that far so thank you and goodbye.